Hello, and welcome to RHDS Music. My name is Rob Hart, and I've designed courses that I feel concentrate on the fundamentals of music. Please check me out at my website at robhartdrumstudio.com, and there you can sign up for free lesson previews, and you can sign up for my mailing list to get the latest information when it drops. What I've done here is I've compiled a series of different interviews I've done with music professionals, and I hope you get a lot out of these different interviews, and I know I've learned a lot, so please enjoy. Alrighty. All right, we're here with Garrison um, doing an interview about music and uh, the industry and um, you know being a tech. So we'll start off with... Um, Thank you for being here, Garrison, and thank you for doing this, and uh, totally appreciate you. Um, I've probably known you for about 20 years now, um, from, from Drum World days. Uh, yeah. We're over 20 years. We're way past 20 years. We're way past 20 years. Thank you. Thank you for, for calling. I appreciate this. Yeah, if you think back to Drum World days, that was like 96 97 right yes so we're past we're past 20 years so that's we're past 20 years but yeah. when i started dealing with you personally it yeah. was about 2000 right no, correct yes it was 2000 when yeah. when we when we started working together from a guy named joe lee i don't know if you remember him joseph lee yes of course yeah. i just oddly enough found i was going through stuff and i found an old picture of joe and i think he's trying to email me or something because I saw his name go scooting across my inbox the other day. So yeah, I haven't spoke to him in a while, but Joseph Lee, I remember him very well. Yeah. Joseph uh, had a record label and then he had a club. And, yes. Um, uh, yeah. So he's, he's a pretty amazing uh, person and great guy too. Absolutely. Very uh, industrious. He gets moving. Yes. yes. So uh, first I want to start off with um, where you grew up. Uh, the Bay Area. I was born in San Francisco, and I grew up in Fairfax, just across the bridge in Marin County. And I was there for, good God, a number of years. And then I moved back into San Francisco. And then after San Francisco, a couple moves there, I ended up in Los Angeles. Wow, cool. Yeah. Um, when did you first get into music? Listening or involved in working it? um everything everything okay when did, when did you first you first uh you first got really interested when did you first start um uh having interest in playing music oh okay yeah the first uh from you know going back in the way 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 back machine my first love of music was actually old frank sinatra albums the concert sinatra was this vinyl album Vinyl, is that a repeat? Is that a, anyway, I had the concert Sinatra on vinyl. And every night when I'd go to sleep, I would play that album. And I knew that somehow, somewhere, I was going to be involved in music. I mean, even as a kid, I would listen to old 50s rock. And I got into the concert Sinatra and I got into the old, you know, standards or whatever you want to call those the crooners you know you had all those voices that you'd listen to that your parents would you know infiltrate into you going oh you like frank sinatra then you got to hear this and here are show tunes and and all of this world of music and then i was um god i don't know i was a kid and my parents my father informed me that his father was the trombone player for al jolson and his mother played concert piano in San Francisco. So at, at a certain age, all of a sudden, I, I understood that there was music in my family, that there was somehow, there was this ability to play or to be involved in music. And so the older I got, the more and more I wanted to get into it, but I didn't want to play trombone and I didn't want to play piano. So uh, at one point, my brother got a drum set, an old fiberglass pearl sparkly kit. And that was in the basement for a number of years. And then it was going away. It was being sold or given somewhere. And I wanted it. And of course, my parents said, well, you want it because we're getting rid of it. 
So I took that as a challenge. So I started working on drumming on anything I could. I got a pair of sticks, I got a metronome, and I practiced on pillows and pads, and I made pads and I made things until I was old enough to save up for a kit. Um, but this this wasn't an immediate run. It wasn't five, six, seven, eight, ten. I bought a drum set. This, you know, you're a kid. You get waylaid. You get into high school and you get distracted by sports and other things. But music was always there. There was always something about music that was coming back to me. So my musical path, you know, dipped and ran. I was a kid. You you lose interest in things. You get other interests. And as time went on, I had to do things you had to go to school then you have to get part-time jobs in the summer and and it just goes on and on and on um, but I always wanted to play drums and so I finally got to the point where I made enough money that I could buy a used kit and I bought an old beat-up Gretsch kit that needed a lot of work and I rebuilt the whole thing I went to a friend's house and made new tom brackets and things because I didn't know that you could go and order these things. It's not like the internet was alive. I and I had to make my stuff happen, so I made it happen. And I would order certain parts, and then I'd make certain parts. And since the Gretsch kit had the old ball and socket thing, you know, remember that where they put the ball right in the shell? So when you remove the plate, you have a hole that's this big. Well, no, no tom bracket would fit. It would fall through the hole. So I made backing plates on all of my shells and drilled into the backing plates. And this began the, the evolution of taking something apart and rebuilding it, you know, becoming the tech side. And that was not something I went for. That was just something that had to happen because I had to rebuild my whole kit. I had to make it functioning. So I had a tom of bullhorn on the mount and the skinny L arms and brackets. And, and I made it work. And that was the first kit. And that was just out of high school. I put that together. Um, but then I was way out in Marin County and I didn't have gigs. There was nobody near me that I could play. I was out in the boondocks. But I met a lot of musicians that lived out there. Uh, Michael Carabello was one of the key musicians that I met. He was the original Kunga player for Santana. He lived in the same town. And so we got to talking because we'd run into each other because I worked at a video store and he would always rent videos late at night and just conversation happened. This is, you know, time goes on. And he was playing a gig, oh God, I think it was in Tiburon, you know, by the bay. And he asked me to show up. And I showed up to the, the club called Amadeus and I walked in. And it sounded horrible. It was one of the just, it was the music, not the music was bad. It's just the, the sound was bad. You know, the, the, he had, it was him, I think Matt Apps on drums, Tal on guitar. I mean, he had real musicians, but it sounded bad. And so he saw me and, you know, waved and then went, you know, like, how's it sound? You know, we were playing charades from the audience on the stage. And I, you know, held my nose. It sunk. It, was, it sounded bad. And I looked over and there was a soundboard, unmanned. There was nobody manning the soundboard and, and all these things, just wires sticking everywhere. And I looked at it and looked at him and they took a break. And so I walked over and I brought all the faders down, turned everything down, repatched it real quick, and then brought up everything to a more reasonable level for the club. And everything opened up. And then... Afterwards, he came up to me and said, you're hired. And I didn't know what that meant. I had no clue what that meant. What do you mean I'm hired? I'm, I'm some guy that you invited, and I'm going to go play drums, and I'm going to be a famous rock star drummer. And he said, I can teach you drums. You can work for me and tech, and you'll get drum lessons for everybody that you tech for. Realistically, you're seeing them play. That's the best lesson you could get. And I thought about it for like, you know, a millisecond and went, makes sense. So I ended up teching for Michael Carabello for years. Steve Smith, Michael Shreve, Matt Apps, David Garibald, all these drummers that you know in the Bay Area. We did all these gigs with Neil Sean and Ross Valerie 
and Daryl and I mean, these were all the Bay Area musicians that I would end up teching for because I was part of that group. I got let in. And in between all of this, I was still going to school at San Francisco State studying business and audio engineering. And in between school, I would run off and do a gig and then go back to school. And this kept going back and forth, back and forth. And um, I realized that I wasn't playing drums. All of a sudden, there was, the, I mean, I was screwing around myself and tapping on stuff, but I wasn't playing with anybody. But I was all of a sudden engineering and doing all the other work. And I went, okay, this is where I'm currently heading. In between going to school and doing audio engineering and everything else, I was just kind of pulled that way. Not that somebody said, you can't play drums with us. It's just I became a better tech and an engineer and a coordinator than I did a drummer. So I didn't, I didn't buck it. I didn't fight it. I just let it go. And, and as it turns out, I went from all these great drummers all the way up to Tony Williams asking me to be his road manager in tech. So again, another opportunity to watch a drummer play, you know, put that in your toolbox of playing. I mean, Taking a lesson from him is amazing. Taking a lesson from any of those guys, Steve Smith, Matt Apps, Shreve, you know, you can take a lesson and they can show you what a paradiddle is. But when all of a sudden they apply it, each one applies it differently. So that's where I also got this big, crazy, I not idea, just crazy windfall of, there's more than one way, even though it's a paradiddle and there's only a paradiddle and that's what it is, but applications and how you apply yourself and how you feel and breathe. Then I went, I'm going to suck in as much as I can. And then there'll be a point where I'll be playing and I'll have a big toolbox of knowledge. And that's kind of where I started to run all the way up through Tony. So your question of I grew up in the Bay Area, not all of a sudden where I, you know, I, I ran fast with the subject to Tony. And, and again, th this is years of stuff because, you know, you, your life happens, you know, things come up. You don't, it wasn't, it wasn't, like I said, six years old and all of a sudden I was on the road with Tony at 13. No, I had school and things and, and it took its time. You can't force time. Things will happen. So, um, uh, that's kind of how it started. So um, did you take, did you have, um, did you go to school in San Francisco or high school, uh, junior high? Did you have music programs, uh, symphonic band, concert band, jazz band, marching band, any of that stuff? I didn't do any of that. No, that's the odd thing. When I was in school, I didn't do any of the jazz band stuff. I played sports. And in retrospect, I probably should have. It would have broadened my perspective. I didn't start studying music until I got out of high school when I started taking my early business courses. I also had piano and I did an entire run of classical piano. So I was doing business and classical piano. And after I finished um, a large portion of the piano, I went, well, I still got a lot of business to do and I got a lot of business to learn but I'm geeking out on audio stuff and how things sound. So I went from piano and I dove right into audio engineering. So at San Francisco state, audio engineering was my minor and then business administration was my major. And those two went like this and that worked out better for me because I had more practical stuff doing audio than I did playing piano or drums. And then when I got to work with Tony, he asked me, he said, what do you know? You know, not how much you know, but just where are you coming from? Because I was recommended to him by Narda Michael Walton. Tony was looking for a tech, contacted Narda, and Narda said, well, I use this guy. And, of course, I, I was gone, and Narda kind of lost me at that one. But, you know, I said to Tony that, you know, I'm at San Francisco State, and I'm studying audio engineering, and I'm doing business. So he liked the fact that, I wasn't a drummer. I was more business head savvy and audio savvy than I was musician savvy. So it made me a good component for being his road manager, his tech, 
and his audio guy live because I had sort of a focus and I wasn't trying to be a drummer anymore. Although I still want to play drums and I do play drums and I love playing drums. That role in my life with Tony was I was not going to be a drummer. There's just no way. I'm not going to be a drummer in Tony's band. You just not. Yeah. So it worked. So awesome. jazz band stuff, it would have been fun, but I don't, you know, it, I didn't do it until I sought out piano and that was my own objective. And then it morphed into where it ran. And I think it worked out. So would you say you had, um, when you got through the phase of teching for everybody, did you have mentors that, that uh, were guiding you? Uh, maybe in San Francisco State or tech-wise, uh, were there mentors that you looked up to? That were, that were techs? Or anything, just uh, uh, mentors in life. My mentors <clears throat> were the musicians. Um, and, and I don't think, I, 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 uh, Neil Sean was probably one of the biggest mentors because he was, um, I mean, it's Neil Sean. I mean, the guy's a, a legend. He's a guitar god and he doesn't get the credit he deserves. But Neil and Carabello and Shreve, all of them were my mentors, but they were my friends. So I was working with them and we did stuff together, but I've always respected what they were doing so i was absorbing that knowledge and one of the things that you know i don't think they ever realized how much information they were giving me that made sense to me except for one time neil pointed out to me because he had a studio in, in oakland called gush studios and i was over there a lot with his engineer um and and i don't remember exactly where we were but neil said to me that I can hang out with him all I want. I can do all that stuff I want with those guys. I can do whatever it is, but I still I can't leave school. I have to stay in San Francisco State. And I have to finish school or I can't hang out with them. So that was one of the factors that kept me going. So if you're talking about mentors, then that would have been all those guys including that that comment where it kept me focused you know you can come to the studios all you want you can work with us where you'll help us you'll learn all these things but if you leave school you can't you can't come and hang out with us which is kind of a, a good statement because it it grounds you really quick you know you're you're hanging out with all these famous people going, ah, I'm going to be, yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be. And then all of a sudden they go, yeah, you're not going to be because you're not going to hang out with us unless you accomplish this. And um, while at San Francisco State and working with Tony, I was finishing up, I had one or two classes left in, to finish the business degree. The audio stuff was done and I could have gone on and done more and more and more audio. And then business, you get your degree, and then you go on and on, get finite definitions if you're where your focus is. And I was finishing up a class. There was a class on music history and something else. There, was, there were the electives. I was finishing up my degree, and there were the electives. And there was a – I remember attending this class where the teacher was talking about, you know, this is American music, and these are the people that are in the music scene today, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm listening to him, realizing that he's not talking about any of the people I'm working with. And the people I'm working with are defining it right now. I mean, Journey was, you know, already just huge. And Santana had already established it. And I'm like, he hasn't mentioned any of these guys, any of these bands. So I questioned his curriculum. I go, there's no mention of... Tony Williams, there's no, and he took offense to it. He was upset that I questioned the curriculum of that class. And just about that point of time where I was questioning things, Tony said, we're going to go on the road. We're taking off. We're going to tour Italy and Europe and you're the guy, you know, all of a sudden I was the guy for him. So I had a choice, go back to this elective classroom and listen to a guy talk about things that 
I mean, you could I, you could say I had a little piss and vinegar in me. He was talking about American music, but he never once touched on what was going on right around the Bay Area. He could have said, oh, yeah, this came from New York and this is Chicago. And currently in the Bay Area, these are the musicians. But never once. I mean, it's like he had his own objective. And I think he was... And that's fine. I mean, you know, that's his thing. But then I started to question it. And I said, I'm out of here. And he goes, where are you going? I said, I'm going to go tour with Tony Williams. And I took off. So I never did finish that class. So probably I could go online and get a hold of San Francisco State and go, hey, there's one class I never finished because I questioned this teacher's authority. Um, I'm the guy that left. You know, can I take it again? And, you know, who knows what San Francisco State would say, but. I, you know, I took off. I didn't, I, I kind of had to do more and that was it. But I always respected, you know, you were talking about mentors and you're looking at a teacher at a university going, you're supposed to be a mentor. You're, 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 you're qualified as a teacher. So why am I questioning you? I never questioned the musicians I was working with. I never, I mean, Tony and Narda and, Michael Shreve and the, you question you ask them questions you go hey when you did this gig or how do you do? and they go oh yeah I did this like this and can't get that in the classroom so there was a point where the book stuff was set aside and my mentors became friends of mine which is lucky as hell I mean you rarely do you get to say I worked with my mentors or my mentors became my friends I mean, to this day, I'm still friends with Shree and Smith and Carabello and I talk three times a week. I'm surprised the phone's not ringing right now. His ears must be buzzing and my phone will ring. It'll be him. All of these people uh, I still talk to. Narda and I still email and we talk on the phone when we can. So I lucked out. You know, Had I been a drummer and jumped into a jazz band or a rock band, I may or may not have made success out of it, but I wouldn't have had this unit of friends and mentors. So your mentor question is, is, is awesome. It's you, you never know who your mentors are going to be and you don't know who your friends are going to be. And it's awesome when they're both. Great. Perfect. Yeah. Now I'm going to shift over to the drum set again. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you, did you have a practice routine? Did you, did you, did you take, um, you were saying you were doing these different kinds of things with um, um, some of the local ladies, uh, Michael, did you have, um, did he give you a, a lesson every week? Uh, like a lot of times we take lessons in, with our teacher and the lesson, there's a lesson assignment and, and you do your lesson assignment, you come in, prepare for the lesson and you play and then you go to, you know, the next part. Did you have anything right. like that or? I, uh, yeah, I lucked out on, I had, aside from the drummers that I was working with and absorbing that lesson, I didn't, I didn't sit down with Shreve and get lessons from Shreve. It's funny or, or odd. The drummers I worked for and worked with when we did gigs and shows, I didn't sit down with them. I sat down with uh, David Lauser from Sammy Hagar and, uh, and Getz from Big Brother and the Holding Company. Those were my first teachers. Those were the guys I went to for uh, understanding the rudiments and the, and the locking in. Because Lauser, when he, if you listen to Sammy Hagar stuff, you go, oh, yeah, it's, you know, I can't drive 55 big rock tunes. You listen to those tracks and he's dead on, you know, I mean, it's, he knew his camps. He knew it all. And I lucked out on getting lessons with him because he put an ad in, um, what was it? Uh, Bam. Remember Bam magazine? Oh, Bay Area cool. Music? I, I did. That was my main source of advertising. Yeah. Bam. It was Bam and the Bammies. And every year they'd be show up at the Bammies or the Bam magazine was paper to begin with. And you'd go there and you'd find out who was listing and doing lessons, who came off the road and was now doing lessons and you go get lessons and they go back on the road. And, but um, yeah, Lauser and, and Getz, those were my teachers. And I, I took it as this is where I'm going to start and I'm going to grab this stuff. And then I'm going to see the live stuff from the other guys. And I'm going to make that, that toolbox. 
So the, the sit down, write out little things and show me a paradiddle or show me a single stroke or show me a five or a nine or seven. Those were the two guys that were doing that to me while the other guys were playing live. And I would try to combine those two. Wow. So you had a pretty awesome you know, exposure to uh, mentors and teachers naturally. Yeah. 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 Um, most people have a teacher that they go to um, that is a um, in-person lesson once a week. Yeah. Uh, so uh, next question, uh, being in the music business, uh, what do you think is the most important skill for a musician or drummer to have? Most important skill? Yeah, like uh, communication skills, um, uh, attitude skills, um, you know, being able to play. Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if, you're, if you're saying something like skills, I mean, because, you know, once you learn the paradiddle, you then go to the Rademacue. I mean, those are skills and those are techniques. But if you're talking about an interpersonal thing, um, one of the th patience, because you can't force time. Uh, you know, and, and in songs and s stuff when you're playing, you can rush things and you can drag. But if you force something, you kind of get a kickback. So there's that. And I also think you, you, you have to be able to hang. You, the patience and, and you have to be able to hang with people. Even if you're not in the, in the band. Let's say you're a friend of the person in the band. And you're, the band is a unit, and they all, they have their clique. They've been around each other for four years, five years, and they know what everybody else is thinking. And then you're brought in, and you're kind of new. But you want to be there, and they accept you. You got to be patient. You got to be able to hang. You got to be able to do the nothing and still go on. You have to accept the fact that. You know, you got to know your limitations. You're you're invited into something. You're mainly maybe you're just there to be part of the hang. Maybe you're going to be folded in and be part of the group. You don't know, so you got to be able to do the nothing and be patient, because you never know when that phone will come around or that call or that nowadays email comes around and goes, "Hey, you were cool to hang with. You can do the nothing with us. Why don't you come and?" join because so-and-so's can't do the show or can't do the tour. We think you're a good fit. Well, right place, right time, and then good attitude. Right. Right place, right time. And are you prepared? You know, you hear that a lot. Oh, I was in the right place at the right time. I walked out the door of the grocery store and there guy walked into me and offered me a job. Well, you could be offered a job in a, in an industry that you're not even familiar with. So it would be a waste. They're not going to offer you the job in chemistry if you, you know, make donuts. So you have to be prepared. So right place, right time. And are you prepared? And if you're not prepared, you know, if you don't have that information in your toolbox yet, that doesn't mean you're not going to get it. It just, you, it's up to you if you want to pursue it. Because then again, you know, let's say you wanted to be, you know, a chemist and you started studying it that person you bumped into that offer may not have worked out for you at that time but down the road you could go hey by the way i'm now studying chemistry and they go oh yeah i remember you because you were okay to hang with at that time so right place right time and are you prepared are people forget about the are you prepared part and doors and things do come back around you know oh i missed that opportunity yeah don't, don't kill yourself over it. Learn, take it and go, I'm going to learn from it because down the road, somebody else may offer me something similar, may not be the same person, but it'll be within that same ability and I will now be prepared and then I can run with it. Awesome. Yeah. Um, some other jobs in the music business uh, that you have done and I know when I met you you're working at drum world in San Francisco which was actually a huge it was like a drum 
Emporium uh, when it when it w blew up. Um, it was the biggest yeah. store in San Francisco. They had yeah. four symbol rooms and um, they had lessons and they had a huge, it was like a huge warehouse. And so can yeah, you- Yeah, it was on uh, Mission Avenue. Yeah, Mission. yeah. The, they used to I worked- Geneva. Yeah, Mission in Geneva. I worked, I worked in a, in a drum, sh it was a drum shop. It wasn't a music store. It was everything from ethnic drums to you. You had weird, I mean, just goofy things put together with old bottle caps to, you know, Latin percussion stuff to all the drum makers. There was Tama, Pearl, GMS, DW, um, the cymbal rooms. You had a room dedicated to Zildjian, Peisty, Sabian. You had teaching rooms in the back where you had, you know, all the old, traditional old school teachers to new teachers coming in. Tony Williams taught there. Um, old man, Bob, I, I can't remember Bob's last name, but he was the old, he was like the old high school teacher that just taught kids the very basics. Um, Garibaldi worked out of there. Um, I think Mike Sparrow, Michael Spiro, Michael Spiro did a couple of lessons there. Um, God, who, there was, uh, can't remember all the other guys, but yeah, drum world was where I worked and you know, that's was money coming in so I could afford my underground apartment at a house and still go to San Francisco state. Again, that's, that all ties in. I was living in the city while going to school and, and you know, you, you've got to pay bills. I'm sorry. If you're at, at school and you live in, the, in a house, you've got rent and not, you know, you got to work. So yeah, I worked at Drum World. On, it was at the corner of Mission in Geneva, and uh, I don't know what's in that building now. And I heard that Drum World, the name, was sold, or the company was sold, and then whoever bought it moved it. Was it San Leandro? Is it down the road now? Where is it? What well, what happened is um, Don, the owner Garzo. Yeah, I remember Don. He he moved to San Mateo. San Mateo, and, okay. and then um, a guy named. Uh, Phil Solar had bought it from Don and um, actually taught there for a, a bit uh, for a few years. And then he sold it, you know, and, and that was the end of it. Uh, oh. Don passed away. Um, so I heard. Yes. Yeah. Um, he was an interesting guy. <laughs> yes. That would, that's a conversation we can have over a, over a cup of coffee or something. Yeah. So anyway, um, but he did have some vision. I, I don't quite know his background, but I know he had some vision and he made it happen. Talking about Don? Don and, yeah. and the big and the big drum world, you know. Right. The, the drum huge, world started, huge, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he, he had a, his starting was, um, was it his father or his uncles had a music shop and he got the corner and handled the drum division of the music shop. That's how he started. And then, um, oh God, you know, it, like middle of the night, the name will come to me what the store was called. Uh, but then he grew, drums kept growing and growing. So he moved out of that shop, Giovanni's music, ah, and he actually had drum world on Geneva because Mission ran the long way and Geneva yeah. was the short. He had Drum World over here on Geneva, and then when he got so big, he moved down on Mission to a larger building, and that's when that huge explosion of Drum World happened. Right. And that's when I started working for him. He wanted me to work for him prior, but I, it didn't work. There you go. It didn't work out, and then come around, I ended up working there and living nearby and going to San Francisco State. And so it all, you know, down the road, it worked out. And that's where, yeah, that was it. Drum World was the place to go in San Francisco. Absolutely. It, it was, it was uh, amazing. And the hang was amazing. And uh, for me personally, I took lessons from Tony there per, uh, privately. And right. um, around that time, you know, I met you and I met, there was Steve Laporta. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and, um, I wouldn't go there up there all the time, but when I would go there, it was, it was really awesome. And uh, I have one Tony Williams experience where he, his car broke down and, um, 
and I said, can I give you a ride to, to, you know, somewhere? He's like, no. And he was just cool. He goes, this stuff happens. He's smoking a cigar in front. And um, he was just like, he was okay with it. You know, it's just like, yeah. can I help you? Can I do? No, I'm cool. I'm good. Yeah. Self-sufficient. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So um, the next question is around that time um, when, you, when Tony asked you to tech and he was teaching, um, and for me, um, he was trying to do this, um, uh, he was trying to carry on this tradition of, of filming every lesson. And, um, you know, he's a real firm believer about carrying on the tradition. Um, yes. um, did you get him or that around that time, did you, you started to um, get into DW? I know he was starting to play DW at that time. Did you, right. were you responsible for um, that turning point where he changed over from Gretsch to DW and eventually getting him to uh, make the jump? No, no, actually I was not. Um, I, yeah, he and I met and started doing stuff together at the transition. That transition from him, from Gretsch to DW was already in motion. Uh, John DeChristopher was involved with that. Um, I, I think John DeChristopher, maybe John King, I'd have to call them to confirm. So, you know, I, the, the point is I was not involved in him going to DW. That was already in motion. Okay. So, yeah, he had that, that was working out for him and in the gears were in motion as I joined working with him that it just happened. So at that point, you you were at Drumworld, and and then you were at San Francisco State. Uh, you started teching with Tony, right? Okay. And I was still working, still at the, but I was in the Bay Area, so I was still working for Shreve and you know Carabello, and then Shreve moved to Seattle. So then it was Steve Smith and David Garibaldi and Narda, you know all that craziness, and then running over and doing work at Neil's studio at night with his engineer. You know, anything I could do to learn more about engineering and the, the backside of it, you know, what was not on stage. Anything I could do to learn more, I would do it. And at that point, and you're learning all these different things and hanging out with um, all the professionals, did you – did DW ask you to work there or how did you, um, how, what was the introduction to, to um, moving to LA and getting the uh, job at DW? How did that happen? How was the start of that? And was it around that time? It was late. It was, um, the, I mean, obviously we were playing DW drums. So I knew John Good. I knew John Good because John Good was the person that Tony worked with at DW to get the kits that he got. Um, I didn't, it, um, I'm trying to do the quick math in my head. Tony, just prior to him going in the hospital when the, all, when the unfortunate happened, Tony was working on Wilderness, that album. And then he realized that he wanted to get into soundtracks and movie scores. And that's what the, the springboard for him was was he we did the uh the house of blues show where we he did a clinic and then he came out and played the rock songs and blew everybody away he had bob daisley on bass and lyle workman on guitar and we played rock songs and the world went nuts tony's playing rock i can't believe this then we did wilderness and he realized that he wanted to get into music scores he could do this this is where he was heading he was studying orchestration and he said to me at one point, he said, I'm going to move to L.A. Would you consider moving to L.A.? And I said, absolutely. So we had already planted the seeds that we were going to take off and I was going to move to L.A. essentially to start working with him more because he was going to start doing orchestration and all this stuff and still tour. And Tony passed away. You know, the, the music world stopped. I remember it. I mean, it, it stopped. At the funeral, I ran into John Good, and I said, I'm going to make my way to L.A. at some point. 
would you mind if I stopped by the shop and we had lunch? He goes, no, please come by. That would be great. I said, great. I said, I don't know when it's going to, I mean, you know, it was chaos in my life. I just, all of a sudden, everything that was supposed to be going one direction, gone. Shortly after the funeral, because Tony passed away in February, so February, March, I was putting out feelers for other bands to go work with, to be on the road, you know, to start doing stuff. And I got some offers and I got an offer with a band and I was hesitant because I knew that they were members of the band that were heavy drug users. And I didn't want to be stuck in Des Moines, Iowa with somebody dying because then you're screwed. It's over again. And at the same time, DW called me and said, we're looking for somebody to head up the artist relations at drum workshop. And I said, well, that's cool. If I think of somebody, I'll let you know. And they went, no, no, we're thinking of you. And I went, oh, you know, I mean, it was, it took me back. I mean, because in my mind, I was techie boy and doing all that stuff. And, you know, I was going to, but it, but it also, it pecked at my business sense of things. You know, all of a sudden it's a more of a business opportunity than an engineering or live opportunity. And so I thought about it and I said, well, how about if I come down meet everybody at DW and after I meet them if they're okay with me working there I'll take the gig but if they're not okay with me there I won't take the gig and I don't think John had ever been approached like that I think he went wow okay never yeah come down and at the time DW had we were on Bernoulli Circle and there was 30 people at the shop total total I mean, from administration staff to, you know, people in the back, maybe 30, maybe even less. So I, to meet everybody wasn't that hard. I mean, but I spent, I went down there and spent all day meeting every single person in that building until the very end when I came back around to John's office and sat down and there's John behind his desk. And I said, I met everybody. And they're okay if I come in and work here. So I'm okay with working here. And he goes, great. And he got up and he walked out and he left, he left the building. And that was it. And I didn't know what, I mean, you're, I'm in an office now alone because he left and uh, came back in a second later and I didn't know what was going on. He had to go and he was running to the courts to officially adopt his daughter. He was with, who was his wife, now Esther. Esther had a child from a previous uh, relationship. And through all these years, John had never officially adopted her. The day that my interview was the day he had to go and do all the paperwork. So he was in a hurry. So he said, I got to go. And he ran out the door. And that's what that was. So I flew back home to San Francisco. And that was, so I did that whole thing on a Friday. Come Monday, I called them first thing and said, I'm in when can I start? And they said, when can you get down here? And I had to give my two weeks notice at drum world because it's only, you know, you proper. And so I gave my two weeks and I loaded up my little red Nissan truck that had a bent frame and rode sideways and drove all the way down to Camarillo. I got a, an apartment in Camarillo right near Oxnard, unloaded my stuff, slept on the floor, got back up, drove back to San Francisco, got the remaining stuff, put it in my truck, drove back to LA, unpacked everything. That was a Sunday. And then Monday was Cinco de Mayo, May 5th. And there was a big party at DW and I showed up and that was day one. And that's where I am today, still at Drum Workshop. But that, that opportunity came because, you know, John had known me through dealings with Tony, the business side of things. He didn't, you know, he didn't know what I did teching or engineering wise. He knew me from the business side. He knew me that I was the one that was organized and getting all this stuff together. And we were, we had kits throughout the world. And Tony, Tony was the connection to DW and that. And John's theory was if I could handle working with Tony, uh, I could handle working with any artist. 
not that Tony was a bad guy, but Tony was very demanding. And Tony asked 110% out of you because he was giving 110% himself. It wasn't Tony, I'm Tony Williams, therefore you have to do what I say and I'm just going to be Tony. No, no, Tony was 110% doing what he was doing. You had to keep up with him. So if you were able to run with Tony, Tony would pull, come on, let's go, we're going, you're in. You got to be able to hang and put out and show that you're in. And I got dragged into it a little bit and I caught my legs and ran and there it is. Wow. So how long have you been there for? How long have you been working there at DW? At DW? Since 97. So we're at uh, 23 years now. we do a calculator. You know, I can't do it in my head. That's terrible. Yeah, I think I think you're about right. Probably 24 years. 23. 23. Okay. Yeah, because it's 2020. 20 and 17. Hey. Yeah. And really, you, I'm smart. <laughs> and your job, um, what do you do in your job? Exactly. Tell like what's your what's your um, you know, like say what you did in the past, what you what you're doing now. What is your job entail? Uh. I was brought in to be artist relations where I deal with the artist one-on-one. -on -one. I am that connection between the artist and the company. DW manufactures custom made drum sets. You've got gurus like Don and John coming out with new things to make drumming exciting. I mean, John's theory, and I'm, I can't speak for Don, but I know John, because John and I work hand in hand every day. John was looking at drums as if, you know, drummers are giving plumbing stuff and they need to be, you know, here's your drum set, learn how to play it. John and Don pushed the envelope on making drums more exciting to play, easier to play, hardware that was better, better finishes, better woods. I mean, they really made drumming exciting and they elevated the drum set, the dance band American drum set was elevated to whole new levels. So we we're garnishing attention from drummers in the community. They wanted a drum set that was exciting, that played better, that sounded. So I'm that connection. Drummers work with me and I work with the company. It's, it's, it's like uh, I'll get a phone call or an email and we'll discuss how maple shells resonate versus birch or how maple mahogany versus maple maple gum and i'll discuss with drummers for hours on lengths how the shells resonate tones uh, applications of them who does what what drummers are playing with helping them make a decision on where they want their drum set to go and that turned into everything from just a maple kit to sitting down in a room with Neil Peart and discussing every aspect of his kits from the R30 kit all the way up to the final two kits. The look, the shell construction, a lot of that is John Good. John Good comes up with a shell idea or a wood that he's found in the middle of the Ukraine and he lets some artists know, hey, I've got this much wood, it can make three kits, you're going to be one of them and then we're going to go from there. It's, it's um, I, you know, I don't want to say I'm the liaison. I'm, I'm hopefully I'm there to help drummers get what they need to make their job easier. Whether it's a pedal or a clutch, you know, hey, I need a pedal. No, you know, okay, that's standard. That's a pedal. It's the 5,000 out it goes. Hey, I need a snare drum, but I'm looking for it to sound like this, but I kind of, then I get into it with them. So hopefully I'm, I'm somebody they can rely upon to help them make a decision because when we build that drum after all of the conversation and the drummer gets it, it makes their job easier because their job is to play drums. My job is to get them the drums and so they don't have to worry about it. They're, it's like a tech still. Drummers were on stage and I had to set up their gear exactly the way they wanted it so they didn't have to worry. They Their gig is playing. My job is to make sure that gig goes off. So 
I'm the guy now at DW that makes sure that those drums are what they're after because when they get up on stage and there's 50 people in the audience or 50,000, they can't worry about that gear. Would you, um, do you have any big challenges with the job? Is there anything? I remember when I was first dealing with you is they were pretty overwhelming. I remember your emails were like pretty disjointed. <laughs> like I was trying to, it was like I had to go back and like decrypt them. Um, yeah. And it seems like you've changed. Like you, it's a little calmer. Uh, oh. Um, I, that things, things have is evened out yeah. and smooth keel, even keel. So yeah. what, what have been your biggest challenges and what are your, what are your challenges now or how is, how are, how is the business going for you at this point in time? Um, there's always challenges because drummers uh, change their minds a lot, uh, which is fine. You, you're, it's not, it's not a crime. Um, challenges are you, you want to make sure you understand what they're asking because like you had mentioned, some of my answers were, were sort of cryptic. They didn't make sense. You want to be able to use words and phrases that you have in common. When you talk to some drummers, you can't use the word tones. You use the word colors and you describe things in colors. Like I'm, I'm feeling blue and I want this Tom to be sort of red. Well, red means fiery and blue means mellow. So you, you know, you just have to learn the language. It's, it's not that difficult. And you can start to then blend words together and use other words. Um, challenges are always there. They're, you know, drummers are looking for a look that they've never had. I want a drum set that doesn't look like anybody else's drum set. And then you get drummers that go, I like black. I want piano black lacquer. That's it. That's my color. I play it. I go. Um, other challenges like Neil Peart stuff, very intricate artwork. Louis, the painter that we have, who's a rock star in his own right. I mean, the stuff that he came up with for all those Neil Peart kits, you know, after we discuss everything, we have to go get gold leaf and hand apply it. We have to get little brackets to make it look like gears. These are all challenges. But again, we all are a team and we make something that the drummer then doesn't have to worry about. Um, Challenges also come with timing. You know, uh, tours are different now. Um, you know, it used to be album, tour, cycle, you know, and you kind of had that sort of break. And I remember, I, you know, if you got a hold of me uh, just before the touring season, you probably got cryptic responses, running, busy, got it, go, got it, figure, see you, bye. And those were just acknowledgments that, yeah, I, I see your stuff, and I'll get it to you but I'm running down this road right now and I got to catch up. And, but now there's no more release an album touring cycle. It is nonstop. It is, there are tours ignoring COVID-19 right now. Tours go year round. There's no album cycle. So that challenge became, you know, several years ago, I was dealing with all the artists, all of them all the time. I had to get a coworker to help. Me, so I brought in Steve Vega, Steve and I, as soon as I got Steve, and we could then, with all those artists, we could start, you know, separating some of the calls. It made things easier. It also made things more efficient because we could spend more time on each drummer. Our roster is huge. And the tour, like I said, tour season goes nonstop. Steve and I are nonstop. I mean, as we're discussing this, you know, I'm, I keep doing this because I'm seeing these messages come in. The phone even rang, you know, it's, it's nonstop, and that's good. That's not, it's not a bad thing. I don't mind artists calling. I have artists calling me on weekends, and they go, "Oh my God, I'm sorry." I go, "You have a question? I'm here." That my gig is to help you out. So I got to do as best as I can, so that your question gets answered, and your gear gets done. The challenges are nonstop. You want you challenge yourself too because you want the company and you want everybody at the company to produce something that the drummer likes to play. That's why each department is key. I mean, I'm that connection. So I have to understand when the drummer says, blah, 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 pink, blue, purple. 
I have to make sure that when I turn to my paint department, pink, blue, purple are exactly what I say. I can't say orange, brown, and green. It's no longer pink, blue, purple, and I've lost communication. That's a challenge. You want to make sure that those demands or questions from the artist translate to each department. So when it comes to the final process and that drum is done and there's a picture of it and I send that picture to the drummer, the drummer goes, that's what I want. Perfect. So, yeah, communication is 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 essential. So you that's that that's a big part of your job is the communication skills. Uh, I know that you're um, like you said, you answer the phone, you answer emails, um, you're you're accessible. Yes, and yes. I say that's a really great asset that you have. Oh, even if I don't even want to bother you, to be honest with you. I, I only I only call you when if I you know I'm I'm trying to make it very simple and make make your life simple where I don't bother people. I'm sure there's other times when you know you have to be uh, very uh, patient and forgiving, and uh, people get difficult. You're you're sure you're, sure sure. You have people to do navigate. Yeah, you know, and and uh, I mean you. you you, you know, I've been grumpy. I mean, there's, you, you, they, you know, you're, you're a person. You can't forget that you're also a person. You know, even though somebody's calling you and, and let's say they're grumpy. Let's say somebody's in a foul mood and they're upset over a piece of equipment. Something broke. You got to fix it. You go, great. Hey, thank them for, first, at least they let you know. That's important. But thank you for letting me know. Let's fix this. How can we fix this? Where are you, you know, Communication is key. You gotta, you know, I hope that if I miss somebody's phone call, if they call and they leave me a voicemail and I miss the call, that I get back to them in a timely manner that they know that I got their message, at least, you know, even with emails. If I can't get to their question, let's say it's, you know, an email that's this long, I might just go, I just got your email. I haven't jumped into it all the way, but I want to let you know I got it. Now we'll be hitting you back soon. That alone helps diffuse the situation because they know that I saw it and that I will take care of it. That's important because it's kind of like when you call in on a service line for any computer or whatever, and you're put on hold or you don't know if you're going to be acknowledged. And that, then your mind goes and you get frustrated. I want to acknowledge every drummer that gets a hold of me, whether your gig is teaching at a high school to Wembley Stadium. You're just as important. You're doing what you do. And you're kind of counting on me and the crew and everybody at DW to do what they do so you can do what you do. And that's awesome. The fact that they, that, that drummers knock on DW's door and go, what is it you do? I want to be part of this, is a tip of the hat to Don and John. Don and John created drum workshop. John joined DW in 72. Don started DW as a teaching facility. 70? You know, you can look it up, but <clears throat> those two guys are the reason why drummers are knocking on the door. Everybody else at the shop is a reason, you know, Louis the painter and, you know, Francisco's edging and Sean who makes the shells. I mean, those are reasons, but Don and John started something that pushed the drumming envelope. It's awesome. And I'm lucky to be part of it. Wow. That, yeah. That's totally incredible. So in closing, um, <coughs> excuse me, what advice could you give to young musicians who are looking for a career in music? be it different facets of music. So um, obviously um, there's parts of playing live and there's, there's other parts of being in the business. So what, what kind of uh, advice could you give to them? It do all you can. Cause you, you know, I wanted to be a drummer. You know, I, I was downstairs in my basement after I built this Gretsch kit that had been pummeled. And I was, uh, you know, I would go and put earplugs in all my neighbor's mailboxes. 
you know, because I would, because the, you know, I don't know if they heard me or not, but I would go to all the local neighbors and put earplugs in their boxes and mailboxes so that when I was playing, you know, it wasn't that horrific. And I did some, you, every day I did something musical, I, whether it was a pad or a drum set. And then as I got older and I got more involved with other musicians and other people that played music, something every day. And I had book knowledge, you know, that Neil Sean comment. I mean, not that I was going to leave school to go be a, a drummer. I, my objective was still to finish school. But the fact that here's somebody who, you know, can write his own way. And I mean, he's Neil Sean took a moment and said, you can do all this with us, but you can't jeopardize your education. You know, you can't cut that short just to hang with us. That's not going to work because then you're not bringing anything in. So, I mean, there's a world of information out there and there's a world of advice everybody's going to give you, you know, and some things don't come to you when the advice is given to you. And so that's what other, you have to, you have to have patience. Somebody gave me this huge chunk of information and it's advice, but I have no way of applying it to anything I'm doing right now. Well, that's okay. Just hold on to it. It, it, it can come around. So, you know, it's me rambling on about stuff. If I was talking to somebody who said, I want to do what you did, you know, I didn't, my, what I did was not an exact science or plan. I didn't say I'm going to wake up, meet Michael Carabello, and that's going to turn into this, this, and this. I was open to change. I was open to the idea that you could still play drums. You could still get an education. You could still go on. I could have been a lawyer and still play drums, but I wanted to be in the music industry. And I allowed things to influence me and let some of my natural abilities come out. And engineering was one of them and organization was another one. And that's how it pulled me here. And I was open for that change, but I never lost focus on educating and learning more all the time. I didn't just stop learning drums. I mean, there's a drum pad right behind me and there's a pair of sticks and, and it'll probably be in my casket. And you know, when I'm a thousand and it, it, you just, you stay hungry. You know, all those, all those words that you hear people say, like, oh, get off my lawn. When I was your age, I knew what I was doing. Great. Just be open for the fact that things are going to come your way and absorb it. Be patient with yourself because just because you want to go and hang with that person or that group, you may not get in just yet. You know, you, it may not be right. Tony Williams didn't get to play with Miles when he first asked. I mean, that's a famous story. You know, a lot of people know this. He, he was in the audience and he walked up to Miles Davis at the break and, you know, and asked Mr. Davis if he could play. And Miles says, why don't you sit down and listen? So Tony went back and sat down and listened. And Tony went off to play with Jackie McLean. And then it came around that Miles asked Tony to play. So listen is one, you know, because you never know what you're going to hear and how you're going to use it later patience, be able to hang, you know, give yourself a break. So, so there's a drummer that's better than you, you know, you might, you being Rob can probably blaze me on a Swiss triplet, even though I worked for the guy, you know, Tony's thing. He loved the Swiss triplet. You could blaze me on that. You hands down do it better than I can. I have to be okay with that. It's when you start to self defeat that you can't grow. If, if I was never okay with that and I hold a grudge that you do a Swiss triplet better than me and that's wrong. I'm putting false negativity on you and that's something that you have to learn. So he does a Swiss triplet better than me. Doesn't mean I can't do it. I can do it. I can go play and you have to be able to grow. So, you know, what advice? Listen. Ex be okay with what you know. Know that you can learn more. You can get better. It may not be at the same rate as somebody else. You may not get that drummer's chair because they were better than you or they could hang, but that doesn't mean that drummer's chair won't become available or somebody else's chair. Same thing with guitars. Engineers, 
you know, you listen, li you know, if you look at your selection of albums and you go, oh my God, this guy engineered all of these albums, you know, Alan Parsons, you know, from Pink Floyd days and the, the producers of today, you know, Mike Klink and uh, Claire Mountain, all those guys. And you go, I see this guy's name on all these albums I love, you know, be inspired by it. Take it. You know, what did they do? Try to find out. Try to do it, but be okay with the fact that you may not be there yet, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get an opportunity. So, you know, be open, be ready for it. Right place, right time, and are you prepared? And and if it blows past you, something else will come. You just be prepared for it. It'll be awesome. That's uh, awesome advice. And um, thanks. Hopefully I got these questions right. <laughs> There is no right or wrong. There's, you know, um, you, you have lived it. So um, these different pathways through your life is very fascinating to me. Uh, what led you to where you are today. Um, I totally appreciate you doing this. You know, it means a lot. And uh, I think it's, it's really valuable for other people. Um, so thank you, Garrison. You're welcome. Thank you. I mean, I, you know, when you sent me the email, you wanted this, I mean, I love to talk about music and, you know, it's like, like I said earlier, you know, drummers go, Oh, I'm looking for a sound or let's talk drums. Love to do it. I, I just hopefully have information that people are enjoying. So thank you for thinking of me. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Yeah. I think you have um, insights on things that people don't know about. Um, you know, things have changed, you know, music industry has changed. So, I think it's valuable for people to understand um, the pathways that one goes through um, and that not, not necessarily the pathway that they think they're on, you know, right. a pathway that might change. Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally changed. And, yeah. And, but I, I still play. I, I, you know, I did buy my DW drum set, you know, it's the same one I've had since 2006 and, and, um, it, it's thunderous and it, and it makes noise and you hit it and it speaks and I love it. You know, drumming, you get, you get to create things with sticks and hit things and mute and choke and let breathe. And, you know, it's, it's a blast. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And, um, you. you know, uh, we'll be in touch, have a, a safe uh, and wonderful um what I guess the rest of the year, because yeah, be, no, yeah. we'll we'll be yeah. at that point where we'll get get um, you know to the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Absolutely, you be safe, and 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 there's a light definitely at the end of the tunnel, and it'll be okay. And if something comes up, and and you somebody has a question about this, or if you have a question, let me know. Buzz me back, and I'll answer the question. I'll take you up on that. You got it. All right, Garrison. Hey man, thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for going through this video. I hope you've gotten a lot out of it. Be sure to check out my website, robhartdrumstudio.com. And there I've compiled online music courses that I've used with my experience of a lifetime of playing and teaching music that cover counting and reading rhythms, hand and feet technique, groove independence, and much more. Until next time, Happy practicing.